Hi everyone, I'm Michele, I work for Football Index, and this is basically like a chat about test-driven development, right? So first of all, this is almost mandatory. So what's Football Index? Football Index is this product that we make at Index Labs, and we launched it in October 2015. And essentially it allows users to buy and sell shares of football players in a betting platform. And throughout the year, based on the value of your portfolio, we basically pay you know, dividends, right? And the price of football players goes up or down based on game performance and social media. Now it's going fairly well. We got 135,000 users, a third of which are more or less active and we're ramping up and we're just in UK, so this is just the start. The biggest portfolio for a single customer is about two million pounds. So some people are taking us fairly seriously. It's not just like fantasy football. And last year, just to give you an understanding, we traded for about 640 millions and we paid about 8 millions in dividends. Now that said, what is test-driven development? So first of all, I mean, the thing is that we hear a lot about test-driven development these days, right? So if you open Twitter or LinkedIn, there's always an article every day by the you know, agile manifesto founders and so on about TDD. But it's actually not such a new technique. So the official definition, as in test-driven development, came by Kent Beck around 2003, but it was also part of extreme programming uh, known as test first those days uh, around 1988, 1998, sorry. And Beck himself basically claims that he merely rediscovered it because it's been used for quite a long time in the industry, at least by some people, right? And so what is TDD? So TDD basically advocates for a different development cycle compared to what most people tend to use most days in most companies. And essentially how it works is that you, rather than starting to, by creating some code, you actually start by creating a test for that code first, right? So you just write one test, then you run all your automated tests, including this new one, and you actually ensure that this test fails, right? And this is actually a very important point because, you know, if you weren't doing that, you might fool yourself into creating a test for whatever you, I don't know, you want to create in your mind without actually testing the expected outcome. So after the test fails, uh, you write the actual code that implements this behavior, and then you run the tests again until they all pass, including these new tests, right? And before starting again with the new test, you refactor your code and you can run the test again during this phase until everything still works and, I don't know, it suits your taste, right? Now, about TDD, there's a lot of myths, right, misconceptions. So initially, I wanted to do a live coding session, but then actually, I realized it's probably more useful to try and debunk some of these myths. So, I mean, myth number one, uh, typically some people, and in particular, even some managers, might feel that time spent writing automated test is wasted. And I mean, I don't know what the cure is for this kind of problem, but in general, it's absolutely not true for a number of reasons, right? And the first reason is that, you know, these automated tests are there to help you preventing regressions, which is a really fundamental point. I mean, the thing is it will allow you to go faster because you're going safer. So it's the same thing. You can race faster with a, a racing car compared to a normal standard car because the racing car has better brakes. And this is pretty much the same benefit you gain here, right? And they also act as living product documentation. So when a new developer, I don't know, is onboarded in the team, they can just browse the tests you produce and understand how the product actually works. And, and this also saves us you know, a, lot of, a lot of time that we're not spending ramping up people like we should be doing otherwise, right? And on top of that, they enable us for quicker and safer refactoring, which is also quite fundamental because we spend a lot of time refactoring code as developers, perhaps even more than writing code. So, but this, this is like, these are all properties of automated tests, right? So how is TDD different? Well, there's another myth 
that basically according to which like writing tests before or after is actually the same thing. And you know, in the end, TDD is not even about writing tests. So, so tests, the tests themselves are a very welcome byproduct, but still a byproduct. So TDD is actually a development technique, right? And writing the test first ultimately makes development quicker because once again, you go faster, you know when to stop, right? So which leads us to the, the second part of this, the banking of the myth number two. And you know, the other benefit that you get from TDD is the quality of the code itself. By writing the test first, like as an example, you literally cannot write non-testable code. It is not possible because you are writing only code for the test to pass, right? And this leads us to getting fundamentally like loser cabling, which is very, very desirable as a property, a more modular code. And you also tend to break down your classes and functionality in smaller packages. And ultimately, this leads to better APIs, right? Because you're writing an API as a consumer. So typically, you tend to write it like you would like to consume it in the first place. So next myth, right? So th this comes up always in most companies. People seem to believe that TDD only works for unit tests. And you, know, you can't really use that with integration tests and other kind of tests. And actually, it's not true. And you know, in particular, you can use contract tests using TDD to design your own API. This is a technique that works really well for RESTful microservices and web apps in general, but for almost all kinds of acting components. And you can use TDD with dependency tests, or those kind of tests that some people call integration tests, to basically build your integration layer with downstream services. And you know, test containers works really well here and has made this technique very popular. And you can also use TDD with end-to-end -end tests. And this is somewhat that is called behavioral driven development, and we'll see how it actually works later on, to drive product development itself, right? <clears throat> so another thing that a lot of developers claim, and a lot of managers as well, is that TDD cannot really be introduced in brownfield projects. Right? So the typical argument goes like this. We don't have automated tests already. And so introducing automated tests is pointless and is never going to work. Well, actually, I mean, on, on the opposite of this argument, TDD is a great way of improving these problematic software projects. And the only thing you need in lack of existing automated tests is actually modularity. So you need to make sure that when you're pushing your commits, you're not breaking some other parts of the application. But as long as the application is modular enough that you get some sort of confidence in this, in this you can use TDD from day one. Now, the, the other myth is that you know, TDD is all about code coverage. You see this in general with automated testing. Some people obsess over code coverage. You see people claiming that they want to achieve 100% or really any X percent makes little sense, uh, primarily for two reasons. First, because actually three reasons. The first is because test is not there to eliminate the risk, right? So the risk is always going to be there. You know, at the very least, you, you have the risk of having written bogus tests that don't check anything. And, you know, so you can only reduce it. And also, code coverage is not indicative of test quality because, as an example, if I remove all the assertions from my entire code base, the code coverage will be pretty much identical and I'm not testing anything as a small example. And, and also some tests can be harmful, right? This is something that is a little bit counterintuitive, but it happens a lot because essentially, if you start testing not your API boundaries and contracts, but the inner behavior and the, your implementation and the code that actually makes that API possible, then what happens is that you basically make your test suit brittle. What it means is that you might want to refactor things. And in virtue of the fact that you're refactoring things, you would have to basically fix a lot of broken tests because those tests were testing some assumptions that are actually not part of your contract. And this is a brilliant example 
when it comes to like private or protected methods and things like that, right? And another problem with tests is that if they're not readable, they only increase confusion and they don't act that living documentation. And if there is law, people won't run them locally continuously for development. So you can actually risk killing your test driven development process by having bad tests. And last but not least, if your tests are failing, you know, pseudo randomly, well, people will lose confidence in the test suit, right? And typically what happens is that a lot of tests end up getting ignored eventually, which is not what you want. So another myth is that, you know, if you use TDD, that's all you need, right? So yes, we use TDD in this project, so we can release whatever, we don't have to test anything else. Well, it's a fairly bad assumption for a couple of reasons. So first of all, you need to really trust the quality of your test, but it's always better to double check. And manual exploratory testing is not replaceable either because you know, the goal of automated tests is to prevent things that you're aware of from getting sideways. But if there are some things that you're not aware of, you can only discover them through manual exploratory testing, or sometimes you think about them, but it doesn't mean that if you got some of the test, you taught already all possible scenarios and corner cases, right? And also, non-functional testing is key for reliability. So things like soak testing and you know stress testing and so on. And smoke tests can all can also help you with gaps in your logic chain testing. Because an example, if we use modularity and say, okay, if this module works really well and I have confidence because of coverage and so on, and this other module likewise, the fact that they their integration might create some problems, right? So you can test that too, but typically having an end-to-end -end flow that shows that everything is working together without aiming for coverage there, can just guarantee that you know you did that reasoning right. So after we debunked a couple of myths about test-driven development, I just want to have a very short paragraph around recent trends, right? So behavioral-driven development, which is actually not that recent, is basically about specifying this test that you write ahead using pseudo natural language, right? So this test can look like English. So as an example, there are some very popular frameworks like Qt or Cucumber for Java or some others for other languages that basically allow you to specify this test almost like if they sound like user stories. Like, so as a logged in user, when I do this, then I get that, right? And while this thing sounds like such a great idea, in my humble opinion, is not that great because basically it takes away two big points of TDD. One is that it acts like living product documentation because basically if I read it in English, I cannot see how the API actually works. And the dual aspect of this, which is even worse in my mind, is that if I'm using these, I don't know, English sentences to drive my development, I'm not actually structuring the API like I want a consumer to consume it because I'm focusing on sentences rather than in deciding, you know, using really, really interfaces or not or suspending functions or not and so on, right? So how about test and commit? Well, test and commit is, uh, it's been around a while actually. And it's been popularized by Kent Beck at the time and it fits really well into trunk-based development and continuous integration. But basically the main idea is that we, start writing tests, we write the code for it after the test is read. And when the test becomes green, you commit, right? And basically each time the test run all green, it's by definition a commit. This is actually incredibly useful. Now, if you work with Git flow, it's useful because you can go back and inspect the commit history and so on, but it's not that great because then you have to squash, you don't want to merge, I don't know, 75 commits in one go. But if you actually work on trunk with continuous deployment, it is fantastic because basically it's literally moving forward with product development every three, four minutes. This might also release in something like hundreds of releases a day, which requires special infrastructure care, but it might be possible and it's actually quite desirable. 
Now, test and commit or revert is something very recent. I'm not sure anyone is actually using it for real in a company, but basically it was some sort of provocation by Kent Beck saying, hey guys, so if, if every time the, the tests are green, we commit, for the sake of symmetry, shall we say that every time the tests are red and you don't expect them to be red, you should revert, right? Now, what is the point of this craziness? Because it does sound crazy to me, and it definitely did before I read the full article. But basically, the entire point is that if you force yourself to work this way, you will also force yourself to really reduce the increment of the code you write before running the test, because otherwise you will be too afraid that you have to revert a big chunk. Cool, so let's discuss synergies. Now, test-driven development works really well, and it works really well with other things that are part of extreme programming and some things that are not part of extreme programming but pre-related. So one thing that it works really well with is ports and adapters architecture, because essentially ports and adapters architecture make your components more modular, and TDD greatly benefits from modularity. Once again, domain-driven design, uh, because domain-driven design puts a lot of attention on designing APIs to basically reflect the actual domain language. And you know, it works really well with TDD because you use domain-driven design to create the test you write as part of TDD. And once again, pair programming, it's a natural fit. There's also even a technique called ping pong programming, where basically like, I don't know, if I'm pairing with someone else, I write a test and then we switch and this someone else writes the code to make this test pass. And then we alternate again, right? So he writes the test or she writes the test and I implement the code and so on. Right, so about continuous integration and trunk-based development, well, we just saw uh, test and commit, so basically, there's a great value in working directly on trunk if you're using pair programming and TDD, because basically there's a live code review throughout. And every time the tests are green, you judge that commit to be good enough to be integrated in your trunk branch, right? And there's also continuous deployment where if you're able to automate things like smoke testing and to an extent some performance testing, you can potentially decide to release each commit that was merged on trunk using continuous integration and pair programming and so on. So with that said, thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know either here or privately or however we want to do it.